Compliments of the Season by O. Henry William Sidney Porter lends the pen name O. Henry to surprise ending signed officially as Sidney Porter. His biography shows where he found inspiration for his characters. Their voices and his language were products of his era. In the short story Compliments of the Season by O. Henry The main character Fuzzy is a tramp who restores the ragdoll Betsy to its rightful owner. A spoiled rich girl. Fuzzy has had too much to drink on Christmas Eve. And spies Betsy's leg partially buried. Sticking out of the ground. Let's look at the story. Compliments of the season. There are no more Christmas stories to write. Fiction is exhausted, and newspaper items, the next best are manufactured by clever young journalists who have married early and have an engagingly pessimistic view of life. Therefore, for seasonable diversion, we are reduced to very questionable sources. Facts and philosophy. We will begin with, whichever you choose to call it. Children are pestilential little animals with which we have to cope under a bewildering variety of conditions. Dot especially when childish sorrows overwhelm them are we put to our wits end. We exhaust our paltry store of consolation, and then beat them, sobbing, to sleep. Then we grovel in the dust of a million years, and ask God why. Thus we call out of the rat trap. As for the children, no one understands them except old maids, hunchbacks, and shepherd dogs. Now comes the facts in the case of the rag doll, the tattered Amelian, and the 25th of December. On the 10th of that month the child of the millionaire lost her rag doll. There were many servants in the millionaire's palace on the Hudson. And these ransacked the house and grounds, but without finding the lost treasure. The child was a girl of five, and one of those perverse little beasts that often wound the sensibilities of wealthy parents by fixing their affections upon some vulgar, inexpensive toy instead of upon diamond-studded automobiles and pony photons. The child grieved sorely and truly, a thing inexplicable to the millionaire, to whom the ragdoll market was about as interesting as Bay State gas, and to the lady, the child's mother, who was all form that is, nearly all, as you shall see. The child cried inconsolably, and grew hollow-eyed, knock-kneed, spindling, and core kilverty in many other respects. The millionaire smiled and tapped his coffers confidently. The pick of the output of the French and German toy makers was rushed by special delivery to the mansion. But Rachel refused to be comforted. She was weeping for her rag child and was for a high protective tariff against all foreign foolishness. Then doctors with the finest bedside manners and stopwatches were called in. One by one they chattered futilely about pepto-manganate of iron and sea voyages and hypophosphites until their stopwatches showed that Bill Rendered was under the wire for show or place. Then, as men, they advised that the rag doll be found as soon as possible and restored to its mourning parent. The child sniffed at therapeutics, chewed a thumb, and wailed for her Betsy. And all this time cablegrams were coming from Santa Claus saying that he would soon be here and enjoining us to show a true Christian spirit and let up on the pool rooms and tontine policies. And platoon systems long enough to give him a welcome. Everywhere the spirit of Christmas was diffusing itself. The banks were refusing loans. The pawnbrokers had doubled their gang of helpers, people bumped your shins on the streets with red sleds. Thomas and Jeremiah bubbled before you on the bars while you waited on one foot. Holly wreaths of hospitality were hung in windows of the stores, they who had them were getting their furs. You hardly knew which was the best bet in balls, three, high, moth, or snow. It was no time at which to lose the rag doll or your heart. If Dr. Watson's investigating friend had been called in to solve this mysterious disappearance he might have observed on the millionaire's wall a copy of the vampire. That would have quickly suggested, by induction, a rag and a bone and a hank of hair. Flip, a scotch terrier, next to the rag doll in the child's heart. Frisked through the halls. The hank of hair. Aha. X. The unfound quantity, represented the rag doll. 
But, the bone? Well, when dogs find bones they, done. It were an easy and a fruitful task to examine Flip's forefeet. Look, Watson. Earth, dry earth between the toes. Of course, the dog, but Sherlock was not there. Therefore it devolves. But topography and architecture must intervene. The millionaire's palace occupied a lordly space. In front of it was a long close moat as a South Ireland man's face two days after a shave. At one side of it, and fronting on another street was a pleasaunce trimmed to a leaf. And the garage and stables. The Scotch pup had ravished the rag doll from the nursery, dragged it to a corner of the lawn, dug a hole, and buried it after the manner of careless undertakers. There you have the mystery solved and no checks to write for the hypodermical wizard or five-pound notes to toss to the sergeant. Then let's get down to the heart of the thing, tiresome readers, the Christmas heart of the thing. Fuzzy was drunk, not riotously or helplessly or loquaciously, as you or I might get, but decently, appropriately, and inoffensively, as becomes a gentleman down on his luck. Fuzzy was a soldier of misfortune. The road, the haystack, the park bench, the kitchen door, the bitter round of eleemosynary beds with shower bath attachment, the petty pickings and ignobly garnered largesse of great cities, these formed the chapters of his history. Fuzzy walked toward the river, down the street that bounded one side of the millionaire's house and grounds. He saw a leg of Betsy, the lost rag doll, protruding. Like the clue to a Lilliputian murder mystery, from its untimely grave in a corner of the fence. He dragged forth the maltreated infant, tucked it under his arm, and went on his way crooning a road song of his brethren that no doll that has been brought up to the sheltered life should hear. Well for Betsy that she had no ears, and well that she had no eyes save unseeing circles of black, for the faces of Fuzzy and the Scotch Terrier were those of brothers, and the heart of no rag doll could withstand twice to become the prey of such fearsome monsters. Though you may not know it, Grogan's saloon stands near the river and near the foot of the street down which Fuzzy traveled. In Grogan's, Christmas cheer was already rampant. Fuzzy entered with his doll. He fancied that as a mummer at the feast of Saturn he might turn a few drops from the wassail cup. He set Betsy on the bar and addressed her loudly and humorously, seasoning his speech with exaggerated compliments and endearments. As one entertaining his lady friend. The loafers and bibbers around caught the farce of it, and drawed. The bartender gave Fuzzy a drink. Oh, many of us carry rag dolls. One for the lady, suggested Fuzzy impudently, and tucked another contribution to art beneath his waistcoat. He began to see possibilities in Betsy. His first night had been a success. Visions of a vaudeville circuit about town dawned upon him. In a group near the stove sat Pigeon McCarthy, Black Riley, and One Ear Mike. Well and unfavorably known in the tough shoestring district that blackened the left bank of the river. They passed a newspaper back and forth among themselves. The item that each solid and blunt forefinger pointed out was an advertisement headed $100 reward. To earn it one must return the rag doll lost, strayed, or stolen from the millionaire's mansion. It seemed that grief still ravaged, unchecked, in the bosom of the too faithful child. Flip. The terrier, capered and shook his absurd whisker before her, powerless to distract. She wailed for her Betsy in the faces of walking, talking, mama-ing. And I closing French Mabels and Violette. The advertisement was a last resort. Black Riley came from behind the stove and approached Fuzzy in his one-sided parabolic way. The Christmas mummer, flushed with success, had tucked Betsy under his arm, and was about to depart to the filling of impromptu dates elsewhere. Say, Bo, said Black Riley to him, where did you cop out that doll? This doll? asked Fuzzy, touching Betsy with his forefinger to be sure that she was the one referred to. Why, this doll was presented to me by the Emperor of Belaokistan. I have seven hundred others in my country home in Newport. This doll. Cheese the funny business, said Riley. You swiped it or picked it up at the house on the hill where, but never mind that. 
You want to take 50 cents for the rags, and take it quick. Me brother's kid at home might be wantin' to play with it. Hey, what? He produced the coin. Fuzzy laughed a gurgling, insolent, alcoholic laugh in his face. Go to the office of Sarah Bernhardt's manager and propose to him that she be released from a night's performance to entertain the Tacky Town Lyceum and Literary Coterie. You will hear the duplicate of Fuzzy's laugh. Black Riley gauged Fuzzy quickly with his blueberry eye as a wrestler does. His hand was itching to play the Roman and wrest the rag Sabin from the extemporaneous Mary Andrew, who was entertaining an angel unaware. But he refrained. Fuzzy was fat and solid and big. Three inches of well-nourished corporeity, defended from the winter winds by dingy linen, intervened between his vest and trousers. Countless small, circular wrinkles running around his coat sleeves and knees guaranteed the quality of his bone and muscle. His small, blue eyes, bathed in the moisture of altruism and wooziness, looked upon you kindly, yet without abashment. He was whiskerly. Whiskily, fleshily formidable. So, Black Riley temporized. What'll you take for it, Den? He asked. Money, said Fuzzy, with husky firmness, cannot buy her. He was intoxicated with the artist's first sweet cup of attainment. To set a faded blue, earth-stained rag doll on a bar, to hold mimic converse with it and to find his heart leaping with the sense of plaudits earned and his throat scorching with free libations poured in his honor, could base coin buy him from such achievements? You will perceive that Fuzzy had the temperament. Fuzzy walked out with the gait of a trained sea lion in search of other cafes to conquer. Though the dusk of twilight was hardly yet apparent, lights were beginning to spangle the city like popcorn bursting in a deep skillet. Christmas Eve impatiently expected, was peeping over the brink of the hour. Millions had prepared for its celebration. Towns would be painted red. You, yourself, have heard the horns and dodged the capers of the Saturnalians. Pigeon McCarthy, Black Riley, and one near Mike held a hasty converse outside Grogan's. They were narrow-chested, pallid striplings, not fighters in the open but more dangerous in their ways of warfare than the most terrible of Turks. Fuzzy, in a pitched battle, could have eaten the three of them. In a go-as-you-please encounter he was already doomed. They overtook him just as he and Betsy were entering Coast Again's casino. They deflected him, and shoved the newspaper under his nose. Fuzzy could read, and more. Boys, said he, you are certainly damn true friends. Give me a week to think it over. The soul of a real artist is quenched with difficulty. The boys carefully pointed out to him that advertisements were soulless, and that the deficiencies of the day might not be supplied by the morrow. A cool hundred, said Fuzzy thoughtfully and mushily. Boys, said he, you are true friends. I'll go up and claim the reward. The show business is not what it used to be. Night was falling more surely. The three tagged at his sides to the foot of the rise on which stood the millionaire's house. Their fuzzy turned upon them acrimoniously. You are a pack of putty-faced beagle hounds, he roared. Go away. They went away, a little way. In Pigeon McCarthy's pocket was a section of one-inch gas pipe eight inches long. In one end of it and in the middle of it was a lead plug. One half of it was packed tight with solder. Black Riley carried a slung shot, being a conventional thug. One ear Mike relied upon a pair of brass knucks, an heirloom in the family. Why fetch and carry, said Black Riley, when someone will do it for ye. Let him bring it out to us. Hey, what? We can chuck him in the river, said Pigeon McCarthy, with a stone tied to his feet. You guys make me tired said one ear Mike sadly. Ain't progress ever appealed to none of yez? Sprinkle a little gasoline on him, and drop him on the drive, well? Fuzzy entered the millionaire's gate and zigzagged toward the softly glowing entrance of the mansion. The three goblins came up to the gate and lingered, one on each side of it, one beyond the roadway. They fingered their cold metal and leather, confident. Fuzzy rang the doorbell smiling foolishly and dreamily.
An atavistic instinct prompted him to reach for the button of his right glove. But he wore no gloves, so his left hand dropped, embarrassed. The particular menial whose duty it was to open doors to silks and laces shied at first sight of Fuzzy. But a second glance took in his passport, his card of admission, his surety of welcome, the lost rag doll of the daughter of the house dangling under his arm. Fuzzy was admitted into a great hall, dim with the glow from unseen lights. The hireling went away and returned with a maid and a child. The doll was restored to the morning one. She clasped her lost darling to her breast, and then, with the inordinate selfishness and candor of childhood, stamped her foot and whined hatred and fear of the odious being who had rescued her from the depths of sorrow and despair. Fuzzy wriggled himself into an ingratiatory attitude and essayed the idiotic smile and blattering small talk that is supposed to charm the budding intellect of the young. The child bawled, and was dragged away, hugging her Betsy close. There came the secretary, pale, poised, polished, gliding in pumps, and worshipping pomp and ceremony. He counted out into Fuzzy's hand ten ten-dollar bills, then dropped his eye upon the door transferred it to James, its custodian, indicated the obnoxious earner of the reward with the other, and allowed his pumps to waft him away to secretarial regions. James gathered Fuzzy with his own commanding optic and swept him as far as the front door. When the money touched Fuzzy's dingy palm his first instinct was to take to his heels, but a second thought restrained him from that blunder of etiquette. It was his, it had been given him. It, and, oh, what an Elysium it opened to the gaze of his mind's eye. He had tumbled to the foot of the ladder, he was hungry, homeless, friendless, ragged, cold, drifting, and he held in his hand the key to a paradise of the mud honey that he craved. The fairy doll had waved a wand with her rag-stuffed hand. And now wherever he might go the enchanted palaces with shining footrests and magic red fluids in gleaming glassware would be open to him. He followed James to the door. He paused there as the flunky drew open the great mahogany portal for him to pass into the vestibule. Beyond the wrought iron gates in the dark highway Black Riley and his two pals casually strolled, fingering under their coats the inevitably fatal weapons that were to make the reward of the rag doll theirs. Fuzzy stopped at the millionaire's door and bethought himself. Like little sprigs of mistletoe on a dead tree, certain living green thoughts and memories began to decorate his confused mind. He was quite drunk, mind you, and the present was beginning to fade. Those are wreaths and festoons of holly with their scarlet berries making the great hall gay, where had he seen such things before? Somewhere he had known polished floors and odors of fresh flowers in winter. And, and someone was singing a song in the house that he thought he had heard before. Someone singing and playing a harp. Of course, it was Christmas, fuzzy though he must have been pretty drunk to have overlooked that. And then he went out of the present, and there came back to him out of some impossible, vanished, and irrevocable past a little, pure white, transient, forgotten ghost, the spirit of noblesse oblige. Upon a gentleman certain things devolve. James opened the outer door. A stream of light went down the graveled walk to the iron gate. Black Riley, McCarthy, and one near Mike saw, and carelessly drew their sinister cordon closer about the gate. With a more imperious gesture than James's master had ever used or could ever use, Fuzzy compelled the menial to close the door. Upon a gentleman certain things devolve. Especially at the Christmas season. It is gust, customary he said to James, the flustered. When a gentleman calls on Christmas Eve to pass the compliments of the season with the lady of the house. You understand? I shall not move step till I pass compliments season with lady the house. Understand? There was an argument. James lost. Fuzzy raised his voice and sent it through the house unpleasantly. I did not say he was a gentleman. He was simply a tramp being visited by a ghost. A sterling silver bell rang. James went back to answer it. Leaving Fuzzy in the hall. James explained somewhere to someone. Then he came and conducted Fuzzy into the library. The lady entered a moment later. 
She was more beautiful and holy than any picture that Fuzzy had seen. She smiled, and said something about it all. Fuzzy didn't understand that, he remembered nothing about it all. A footman brought in two small glasses of sparkling wine on a stamped sterling silver waiter. The lady took one. The other was handed to Fuzzy. As his fingers closed on the slender glass stem his disabilities dropped from him for one brief moment. He straightened himself, and time, so disobliging to most of us, turned backward to accommodate Fuzzy. Forgotten Christmas ghosts wider than the full spirits of the most opulent Kris Kringle were rising in the fumes of Grogan's whiskey. What had the millionaire's mansion to do with a long, wainscoted Virginia hall, where the riders were grouped around a silver punch bowl, drinking the ancient toast of the house? And why should the patter of the cab horse's hoofs on the frozen street be in any wise related to the sound of the saddled hunters stamping under the shelter of the west veranda? And what had Fuzzy to do with any of it? The lady, looking at him over her glass, let her condescending smile fade away like a false dawn. Her eyes turned serious. She saw something beneath the rags and scotch terrier whiskers that she did not understand. But it did not matter. Fuzzy lifted his glass and smiled vacantly. P. Pardon, lady, he said, but couldn't leave without exchange and compliments she soon with lady the house. Against principles gentlemen do show. And then he began the ancient salutation that was a tradition in the house when men wore lace ruffles and powder. The blessings of another year. Fuzzy's memory failed him. The lady prompted. Be upon this hearth. The guest, stammered Fuzzy. And upon her who, continued the lady, with a leading smile. Oh, cut it out, said Fuzzy, ill-manneredly. I can't remember. Drink hearty. Fuzzy had shot his arrow. They drank. The lady smiled again the smile of her caste. James enveloped and reconducted him toward the front door. The harp music still softly drifted through the house. Outside. Black Riley breathed on his cold hands and hugged the gate. I wonder, said the lady to herself, musing, who, but there were so many who came. I wonder whether memory is a curse or a blessing to them after they have fallen so low. Fuzzy and his escort were nearly at the door. The lady called, James. James stalked back obsequiously, leaving Fuzzy waiting unsteadily, with his brief spark of the divine fire gone. Outside, Black Riley stamped his cold feet and got a firmer grip on his section of gas pipe. You will conduct this gentleman, said the lady, downstairs. Then tell Louis to get out the Mercedes and take him to whatever place he wishes to go. End of the story. Thank you.